right, so like let's take Israel. They they can have a main focus for one issue. Yes. The state of Israel. Mm -hmm. Protect it, make sure it's thriving, whatever. Yep. But black people, it's so many different issues. Yeah. So it's like you got reparations, you got criminal justice reform, you got education. And and then so do you think that that makes it harder or it would it be easier to start a pack for one issue, like a reparations pack? Just or, yeah. or like you know what I'm saying, as yes. opposed to trying to cover 35 different things. Yes, right, and and reparations could be that thing because that's the thing that kind of touches everything. My graduates from my school being Forbes bag drop, bag drop, <laughs> a mic drop, bag drop, bag drop. All right, guys, welcome back. EYL, we back home. Uh, been traveling around the world. It's good to be home. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, shout out to everybody that was in London. Yeah. That was amazing. Did you see that on social media? I did not, not yet. Okay, yeah, we got to bring it. Got to get them in yeah. tune. <laughs> we did a, a show at the Royal Albert Hall. You ever heard of it? Yes. So we did a show there and uh, sold out, and it was crazy. Nice. 4,000 people in London. Oh man. The mandem really it was, came. It was an experience. Yeah. Experience to say the least. Financial literacy. People were hungry for it all over the mm -hmm. world. Especially yeah. in our community. Our community is all over the That's world. Right. So um, you know, same stories no matter where you go. Mm -hmm. Um, same issues. But long story short, we're back in yes. New York. And um we are here with a very special guest. This is the first time that we've actually spoken about politics on a local level. Mm -hmm. We've interviewed uh Shine before. And we've interviewed Stacey Abrams. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Shine, I think he's running for prime minister of Belize, if I'm not. At some point, mistaken. I think he will. I think he announced it already. Okay. Um, he was the former opposition leader. Yes. Georgia, even the Herschel Walker thing and Warnock. That's close. Herschel yeah. Walker's looking crazy. Right <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that later. We'll get there. That's another story. <laughs> Herschel Walker. I'll never use him again in Tecmo Bowl. Walker. <laughs> Herschel Walker. <laughs> Tecmo <Tech> Bowl. <laughs> crazy out here. He was ill in Tecmo Bowl. Yeah, he Herschel. was. He was. <laughs> He's one of the greatest of all time. Uh, greatest what? Football players. College. I don't know about that. No, nah, Minnesota. He was tough for Minnesota. He, he's one of the biggest names because he he was in the USFL. Yeah. Trump's league, ironically. <laughs> this um, is true. And then was got to NFL and was traded. It was a big trade. The biggest trade. Dallas made the biggest trade like ever. Yeah. Where Dallas picked up a bunch of picks. They got Troy Aikman. That led to Michael Aikman, Irvin. Michael Irvin. Evan Emmett, Smith. Emmett, like their whole Super Bowl team. They traded Herschel Walker for pretty much their whole Super Bowl team. Yeah. Uh, the dynasty was built off the Herschel Walker trade. Yeah. Herschel. <laughs> wow! Shout out to Georgia. Yeah, you yeah, yeah. I mean, he's a king there, right? They won. They won. Yeah, with him. I mean, I was just there. I was. Uh, I've been doing some traveling, also trying to get out to vote in different states, different cities. I was in Georgia, Columbus, Georgia, and Atlanta, and I watched. I was there to watch the Warnock uh, Walker debate, and yeah. So on the ground, <laughs> so on the ground, people are just like it's going to be close. It's going to be a runoff because you know you got to get to fifty percent. Somebody has to crack fifty percent to avoid a runoff. Um, and I don't think either one will. So there's going to be a runoff. There's a third candidate who's a libertarian who's taken about 4% of the vote, Ooh. which is hurting um, Warnock right now. But the fact that it's even competitive, you know, for people like us from different parts of town is, is crazy. But Georgia also has Majority Taylor Greene, um, who's literally a white supremacist in Congress. Mm. Um, so, but today we have Congressman Jamal Bone. Yeah. So he's actually our congressman where we live. This is true. He's the congressman of our district, which includes the North Bronx to Middle Westchester. Yeah. Right, we got right. New Rochelle, Yonkers, White Plains. How far? How far north are we going? Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon. Yeah. Pretty much stops at White Plains. Okay. Um, perfect. So what's you know so Porchester, the South Shore, so Rye. Uh, Rye City, and then on the other side, Greenberg, River Towns, and then in between, so Scarsdale, Bronxville, Yonkers, Mount Vernon, New Rochelle, uh, East Chester, you know, all those small little uh, villages and, and towns also. So, And in the North Bronx specifically is Edenwald and Wakefield in yeah. the North Bronx. It used to be Co-op City, it used to also be Riverdale, but with redistricting, they just drew new lines. So uh, come January 1st, I'll be officially the rep for these areas in New York 16. What, what district is that? 
New York 16. 16. New York 16? Yep. All right. So this is a conversation that's extremely important because um, a lot of us are not educated on politics correctly. You know, we know about the president and we might know about the governor. We might be educated on senators. We're not really educated on congressmen. And from my understanding, um, the Congress has a lot of power, right? Mm -hmm. It's the House of Representatives and the Senate. And it's like uh, 50 50 in the power structure, right? Is that correct? So currently in the Senate, it's a 50 50 split with the vice president being the deciding 51st vote in case of a uh, tied vote, depending on what the legislation is. And then the House, we have like this 435 in the House. And I think our margin right now is like six votes mm. in the House. And when I say our, I mean Democrats. Right now, Democrats have control of both. But, you know, when people hear that, you know, one of the first things they say is, why aren't we getting more done? And one of the reasons why we're not is because the Senate is so tight. And right now there's something called a filibuster, which we can get into a little bit later, which means you need a super majority in the Senate uh, for a piece of legislation to pass the Senate. So it could pass the House by one vote, all good. It'll go to the Senate. But then when it gets to the Senate, if we only get a super majority, a 60-40 majority, then the law doesn't move forward because of the filibuster, which we could talk about. Um, so, yeah. That's, that's a lot. You, you, you spoke about the district that you're in, Northern Bronx, Eden Wall. Yes. The first time I met you was not far from there. <laughs> you used to be Principal Bowman. Yes, sir. And um, yes, sir. I was teaching in the Bronx in our school. Uh, they, used, they had a PD, Professional Development Day, and we were chosen to go to your school. And um, I was inspired um, by what was happening. It was the first time I walked in a building, and I still remember it. I saw Tupac on the wall. I saw KRS on the wall. I saw Malcolm X on the wall. And I was like, this is what school should be like. Like, we should see images of people that look like us and people we look up to. So how did we transition from education, in that sense, to politics? Yeah, I mean, you know, when you work in schools, you, you know, all of the issues in the community sort of land at your doorstep. Right. Whatever kids are going through, whatever families are going through. So if, if kids are hungry, if families are struggling with housing, if there's a lack of jobs, uh, if there's criminal justice entanglements, if there are mental health issues, all of it come. You, you see it in your school every day. And I got to the point where, one, I, I began to understand how our tax dollars funds public education. Right. So I got to learn about that. And then I got to also learn when I would visit other schools and other communities how in wealthier communities, take Scarsdale, for example, um, their schools receive additional tax dollars because the structure is such where local property taxes fund schools more than federal tax dollars. So thinking about school funding, thinking about the lack of resources in, in certain schools and certain school districts got me paying more attention to politics. And then as I paid more attention, I realized that politicians weren't connecting the issues that my kids and families were going through to the policies that they were advocating for and to the resources that they weren't fighting for to bring into the into the community. So just started looking and paying more attention. And, you know, I opened the school. So I don't know if you knew that, but I'm the founding principal mm -hmm, of the school. So mm -hmm. I opened it in 2009. So I'm like an education entrepreneur in that way. Um, I think the same year or the year after that, Occupy Wall Street happened. So that was like a big deal, obviously, with like, you know, people in tents down by Wall Street talking about 99% versus 1%. And then that just opened my mind to, okay, what's happening with this wealth inequality? So I began to get educated on that. And then shortly thereafter, um, I believe it was Trayvon Martin was killed like a few years later. Mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter movement exploded and obviously you know, being a black male, Trayvon Martin is not an anomaly, unfortunately, you know, from, from Rodney King to, uh, to Ab 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 Amadou Diallo, Abner Louima, <laughs> Ramali Graham, Ramali Graham, uh, Sean Bell, on and on and on. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my school was a school of social justice. So that just, so what was happening in the real world, we tried to make part of our curriculum in school. So kids were learning about it at the same time. Khalif Browder happened around this time as well. That became part, right? So I just, the social issues, the education funding, what my kids was going through, a spike in just kids committing self-harm, 
uh, in my school and other schools just led to me thinking about it. Um, and then Bernie in 2016 also began to talk a lot about the wealth inequality and the economic injustice. And then when the squad won in 2018, they created a lane in terms of what they were talking about that fit with yeah. what I wanted, what gotta, I'm about. You gotta tell everybody who the squad is. Yeah, so in 2018, um, four women of color uh, won congressional seats and and it, they were all insurgents, they were all long shots to win. One in the Bronx in, partic in particular, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez beat a long time incumbent in, in Joe Crowley. Um, and then the other three sisters, uh, I think a couple of seats were open and one, Ayanna Presley also won against a long time incumbent. So those wins were like, they took the country by storm with those wins, but it wasn't just those wins that got me interested. It was what they were talking about. Like they were talking about racial justice. They were talking about economic injustice. They were talking about the issues that we would talk about in the barbershops. We would talk about, you know, on the block. We mm -hmm. would talk about in our schools. And that led me to be like, all right, you know, maybe that's something I could do. And then two years later, I ran and also won a, a pretty big race. All right. So let's get into this conversation. What exactly does a congressman do? Is it congressperson or congressman? Because well, if it's a woman, are they, are they called congresswoman? Yeah, congresswoman, yeah. I mean, it, you could say congressman. You could say congresswoman. You could say congressperson. It depends. Okay. Uh, all three all three work. Um, so we we work on federal policy. I mean, that's pretty much what we do. We make federal laws. Uh, we also are advocates for what is needed in our districts. Um, we all, in New York State, we represent about 750,000 people, each of us. So what I hear in my district from the people I represent is what I advocate for and write policy for in Congress. We also can help move money around in terms of the federal budget. So ensuring that money goes into the areas that are needed based on what I hear in the district. So, you know, in this district, for example, a big issue is affordable housing, right? Like not just in Greenberg, but in all parts of the district. So I meet with constituents, I hear this is an issue, uh, I learn about what what's happened locally on the issue, and then I work with my legislative team to figure out a policy that we can write that would deal with that issue, not just in our district, but nationally. Also, the, the federal government, uh, we, we, we fund not just the federal government, but we fund federal jobs across the country, and we fund uh, international other countries as well. So whether it's the Caribbean, uh, continent of Africa, the Middle East, we provide funding, whether it's military aid or other aid to other countries. So in managing that budget, you know, I get an opportunity to look at where the money goes and then make a decision on like along with my team based on what we've heard on how to move money from one place to another one brief example is i noticed the first year i was in congress uh we give a lot of money to the military pretty much 51 percent of our congressional spending goes to military we give a lot of money to like the bureau of prisons and uh cops programs and we give very little money to like minority owned businesses and investing there. So just working with my team to get money moved from, you know, military, borough, prisons and other things that are detrimental to our communities and move it into areas where we want to see a larger. So impact. like ways and means? So ways and means is one committee. So there are That's the most powerful committee. It's know. considered one of two. So appropriations is one. Um, and ways and means is probably two. Energy and commerce is another one that's pretty powerful. But they're all pretty. They're all pretty powerful. And members of Congress, we also have a bully pulpit. So if I tweet something, if I write a statement about something, it's going to get a lot of attention. You know, we wrote a letter to Biden uh, earlier this year with a couple other members of Congress uh, pushing him to vacate the marijuana convictions of uh, people who were who are nonviolent offenders who were convicted, who were in prison. We wanted him to release them and vacate the convictions. He didn't do it then, but just recently, he actually vacated the convictions of 6,500 uh, 
formerly incarcerated people who had marijuana convictions still on their record that was stopping them from voting in certain states, stopping them from getting housing, stopping them from uh, certain employment. So it's stuff like that. We just, we, we, we do whatever we want in alignment with the needs of our district. And we could go as far as we want to go. Yeah, so you brought up the district, and I know most people are puzzled, like, how many districts does New York have, and how is it zoned, right? Because when I saw you on TV, I'm like, I know this, I know him. Mm -hmm. But you were like, Dallas Ferry, New York. I'm like, how, how did he get up here? Yeah. And so before we started, you said that that's a new 16. So how does that change, and, and, and talk about the importance of how that affects the way people vote. Yeah, so um, the old 16, so I've only been in Congress two years. When I ran... The old 16 included all of the North Bronx, so from Co-op City to Riverdale, and it came up as far as, I would say, Rye. Um, and it included Scarsdale, Hastings on the Hudson as the only river town, Yonkers, Mount Vernon, New Rochelle. That was the old 16. But every 10 years, there's a census. And uh, based on the census data, you can either gain congressional seats or lose congressional seats. So when people, when, 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 Every 10 years when you're being pushed to fill out the census, oftentimes we don't tell people why it's important, right? But mm -hmm. it's really important because if if you get a, a large number of people filling out the census, you get more and you get more congressional seats, you get more representation in Congress fighting for the things I'm talking about, not less. So because we lost a seat, now you have less representation in Congress. And then when you lose a seat, the lines shift a bit where you now have to represent more people. Um, so now I'm representing more people. Lines have shifted a bit. And uh, that's why places like Dobbs Ferry, Greenberg, Port Chester now, White Plains, now they're going to vote for New York 16, which is going to include me in, in on Tuesday. And yeah, there's like 20, I'm going to get the number wrong, but it's over 20 I say 24, 25, I could be wrong, congressional districts in New York State. Um, and every state has a different number. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, all right, let's talk about these committees. So you have 400, how many Congress people are there? 435. So there's 435 Congress people. And each state has a different amount. States like California and New York have a lot. States like Wyoming have little. Yeah, right? because of population. Because yeah. of population. Mm-hmm. But they're all thrown into a pot for votes, right? Yes. So when it when it, so there's two senators. Each every state has two senators. Yes. Regardless of population, mm -hmm. but each state has a different amount of congressmen. Mm -hmm. But all of the congressmen are thrown into the bucket, and they all vote, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, in order for a bill to pass, you have to have the the House of Representatives, which is Congress, and you have to have the Senate mm -hmm. on board. For a bill to become law. For a bill to become law. Many, and then the president has to sign it. Correct. In. Like many bills uh, pass the House and don't move in the Senate at all because the Senate just hasn't functioned for a very long time. Um, you mentioned committees. So there are several committees. Again, I'm forgetting the number, but I sit on education and labor. Um, I'm actually the vice chair of education and labor, and I'm also on the science, space, and tech committee. And each committee has like jurisdiction over different aspects of the country. So science, space, and tech, we have jurisdiction over like artificial intelligence and, and NASA, for example, which means, you know, if I want to go to NASA to inspect what's going on in NASA, just to make sure things are copacetic, I can go as a member of the committee to just do an inspection and see what's going on. Uh, also, that means that generally could mean most of my legislation will be rooted in science, space, and technology or education and labor, but that's not the case for me because I'm very interested in economics, um, which is why I love your show. And that's one of the reasons why we're trying to get on the Ways and Means Committee for the next cycle. So the Ways and Means Committee, Charlie Rangel <clears throat> we used to be the head of the Ways yes. and Means Committee, right? Mm -hmm. Good old Charlie. Uh, okay. <laughs> so they said that's the most powerful committee because that they control the budget for what do they control the budget for? Well, they, they control the tax code. They can tax code. The tax code. Um, so they can help ensure that our tax code is progressive and equitable or, or, or not so much. Um, so they put the policies in place that generates the revenue that comes into Congress. 
that revenue then goes to appropriations to be appropriated accordingly. So that's why those two committees work hand in hand. Those two committees are so powerful. So they bring the money in, then the appropriation committee dictates where the money goes. Yes. I wouldn't say dictates. So appropriations has, um, I think they have 12 subcommittees. And each subcommittee has a certain area, foreign policy, education, healthcare, different areas. Each chair of those subcommittees, along with the members of those subcommittees, decide how money is going to be allocated for the for the annual budget. Now, if you're not on those committees, uh, they reach out to us to get feedback from us so that we can, you know, have input in terms of where the money goes. There's also something called community project funding. So each member, Obama stopped this, but Biden brought it back. Each member is allowed uh, to designate, last time it was 15, time before that was 10, a certain amount of community projects that you want to provide funding to. For example, um, there's a YMCA in Yonkers. We worked with the CEO of Yonkers YMCA to bring in half a million dollars so that they could fund their pool and get it upgraded. Uh, we did the same thing with the New Rochelle Boys and Girls Club to help them provide additional after-school programming. We worked with the Mount Vernon Mental Health Public Health Center so that they could provide mental health services for seniors. So things like that. Um, we, so far, we've helped fund 20, we're going to help fund 25 programs over my first two years and hope to do more next year. So there's the general budget where we're like, okay, you're not funding education enough. There's only like a hundred million in there. We want to up that to 400 million. Hmm. Boom. They don't have to do it, but we make the suggestion. And then the last thing I'll add to that is before we do our budget, the president comes out with his budget and his priorities. And so ideally we would work in alignment with the president by presidents by our priorities if the president is a part of our party and aligned with what the people are saying. Um, but uh, that's always dicey because again, I want to make this point again, there are lobbies that dictate how we spend our money in Congress. And there are very powerful lobbies like the military industrial complex, fraternal order of police, fossil fuel companies, pharmaceutical companies, they literally contact us every day to make sure we not only support the policies they want, but when we fund the budget, we fund it in alignment with what they want. So that's a big part of that as well. It's not just, you know, me, because I don't take corporate PAC money and I don't meet with lobbyists, uh, I don't have a problem hanging up a phone and not taking a call from a corporation because my focus is on what are the people in the community telling me and I try to work with that. Yeah, you said you're the vice chair of, you said education, science, and STEM? Vice chair of Ed and Labor. Ed and Labor. Yeah. And so one of the things- and I'm chair, I'm sorry, and okay. I'm chair of the energy subcommittee on science, space, and tech. Okay, yeah, yeah I mean, rooted in education still, and one of the yes. things I know you were very, very adamant about was, you know, standardized testing mm -hmm. and so i wonder i mean because we talked about this very early on in, in, in ernie leisure like the business of standardized testing that was you were a strong proponent against it i wonder at this point um how much support is that guy and is that still something that you you see as something that we, our kids shouldn't be subjective to it, it it gets a lot of support in terms of ending how we use them mm -hmm. right now the majority of scholars and, and people who work in the space understand that we overuse and misuse them. And we've been doing that for 20 years. And, and our goal has been to use them to close the achievement gap. But that's not how you close the achievement gap. You close it by providing early child education and other things, right? Um, so a lot of people s still would like to see them go away, but there's a powerful lobby um, that wants to keep testing proliferating because there's a lot of money in standardized tests. Mm -hmm. That same lobby works in alignment with like the charter school lobby because there's a relationship between standardized test scores, charter schools, and actually making a profit. Um, and that's why you see a lot of like uh, celebrities and entertainers opening charter schools. Yes, they want to open up schools and give back and do well for the community, but there's also a profit to be made in charter schools, which is why I shout out to LeBron James. Uh, he opened up a public school, which I, which I appreciate. Um, 
But um, yeah, for me, like our kids are brilliant in a variety of ways, and our people are brilliant. Our culture is brilliant, and trying to reduce our intelligence to a standardized test score takes away our natural brilliance and intelligence. So for me, it was always about, okay, what does research tell us, and what do we know that we need to do in schools to really put our kids in, in a position to thrive? Creativity, innovation, STEM, financial literacy, project-based learning. These are civics. Mm -hmm. Like these things are not part of the school curriculum. And if they were, our kids will graduate better prepared to be entrepreneurs, to be, you know, to start the new tech company, to do the different things that I know and we know they're capable of doing. So we're actually going to introduce a bill um, and push into an annual standardized testing and give states the flexibility on how they want to how they want to go about doing it. Um, and uh, that's going to be a big we're going to introduce that soon. So uh, let's let's have this lobbyist conversation. So, all right. So lobbyists control politicians for the most part, right? Yes. So the lobbyists, uh, you got the tobacco lobbyists, Israel. You got, you said the prison lobbyists, and they they put pressure on politicians, and they say, what exactly do they say? They say, well, fund your campaign, yes. but we need this done, and if you don't do this, then you're not going to be. Elected and we next. will stop funding you. We're going to fund your opposition. Yes. And and we're going to make life hard for you. Correct. The real ops. So explain the process. Yeah. So first, J Street? J Street. So J Street actually endorsed me. That's where so, all the lobbyists are located, right? No, no, no. J Street is a uh, pro-Israel Jewish organization that's fighting for a two-state solution in Israel. Where, what's, this, what's the street in D.C.? Oh, where all is it the called K Street? I want to say it's K Street. Yeah, K yeah it's K, K Street. Street. It's K, K Street. Street. K Street. Again, I don't know because I don't meet with them, but it's K, <laughs> yeah. it's K Street. That's where all the lobbyists have office in K Street. Correct. Um, so basically, when I'm at work, I just see mad white people in suits. I have no idea who they are, what they're doing, <laughs> walking around, just meeting with everybody, right? So that that's basically what it is. Um, so I forget the policy, but corporations have figured out how to use the 14th Amendment where corporations are now considered people and money is considered free speech and because of that dynamic people can lobbyists can create uh independent expenditures and super PACs and fund congressional campaigns at an unlimited rate where they could they could spend any amount of money they want to fund the congressional campaigns now someone like me who don't work with super PACs, I only take individual donations, right? So my average donation is about 40 bucks. Uh, and the max you could give me is 5,800 for an election cycle. But through the super PAC, people could throw 10, 50, 100,000 in there and just, and just, and not even have to disclose where the money came from, which is called dark money and control how the election cycle works. So it's not just members of Congress, it's media because they pay for television ads, social media ads, and all of that, and push the narrative that they want through propaganda to make sure one person wins, one person loses. Um, and so, you know, if uh, Pfizer, you know, a pharmaceutical company, any pharmaceutical company uh, supports a bill that they wanna see us support, they'll call us and ask us to support a bill and tell us why. And not Pfizer, but any lobby, any mm -hmm. company. Uh, and they'll tell us why. Um, and then they'll, the, a conversation will be had around, you know, come to this event, let's have a conversation, let us do a fundraiser for you, et cetera, et cetera. Pretty much putting money in your war chest to get you ready for the next race. Um, and again, someone like me, the squad, we don't take any corporate money, so we don't really fall into that. But the majority of my colleagues all do. And that's why when people say, why don't things get done in Washington? It's because of big money in politics. That's like the, the short, quick answer. Mm. Because big money stacks on top of big money. Um, and Republicans are, you know, you know, I don't want to get partisan here, but Republicans tend to give big tax breaks to the wealthiest 
individuals and corporations, and then those wealthy individuals then reinvest in not just stock buybacks, but also like congressional campaigns, Senate campaigns, uh, super PACs, dark money, et cetera, so that they can make sure people that will continue to, continue to support their wealth will be reelected every year going forward. So you're the only male member of the squad. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously you have these packs and, and you have these lobbyists, lobbyists because running a campaign is super expensive. It could be expensive, right? So yeah. if you're taking private, like, I don't think people really understand the price associated with running a successful campaign. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So um, when I decided, I decided to run um, in my in my head uh, spring 2019 for the election in 2020. And first thing I did, first of all, I never ran for any office before in my life. Um, but I did the math, like as I as I started thinking about it, the previous election cycle, Congressman Elliot Engel, who used to be the congressman, had won with only twenty two thousand votes, even though there's like what three hundred thousand registered Democrats in the district, only only thirty thousand people voted, and he won with twenty two thousand votes. So I'm like, damn. This dude's in Congress making decisions that's impacting all our lives with only twenty two thousand votes. So I said to myself, I was like, I could I could knock on twenty three thousand doors myself and, and win. That was my mindset. Um so I started calling family and friends and just telling them I was thinking about running, what what do they think, just getting feedback and everybody was like, Yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody except uh my wife and my mother in law and my mother. Uh <laughs> everybody else was, was pretty was pretty cool with it. Um so but you don't know what you're getting into. So when I when I started calling, I found this organization called Justice Democrats, which is the same organization that endorsed the squad and helped them to win. So when they met me, they was like, yeah, we're going to endorse you too. You're going to be our first endorsement since AOC, um, and we're going to help you hit the ground running. So because of them and because of their their weight, because of the squad, when I, when I launched, it was it hit the cover of the New York Times as a story. And that helped us generate initial money to print flyers that we then started giving out as we were knocking on doors. And this was a year out. But even before that, first thing I did was call everybody on my cell phone and tell them I was running and ask them to donate to the campaign. Um, whatever they could afford, but I was asking like depending on, you know, you know who got a little bit of money, so you asked for like a thousand. Or, you know, someone who don't got that much money asked for like 100, 200, whatever. So I called everybody on my phone, raised like 30,000 just from my phone. The article hit, raised another couple thousand. And then a big part of running is just calling complete strangers for money. Like just, just you know, uh, what we tried to do is call people who had donated to like Bernie Sanders, Ayanna Presley, squad, people who donated to other politicians who are like-minded. Mm -hmm. So we'll call them and be like, Hi, I'm Jamal Bowman running for Congress, New York 16. I'm endorsed by the Justice Democrats, boom, 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 former educator, boom, boom. And then they'll be like, all right, I'll send you. And then we was doing that like 30 to 40 hours a week, you know? And, and at the beginning, I was still working full-time as a principal, which I ultimately resigned um, a few months later. Um, and and then you're just doing a bunch of calls and, 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 and meet and greets constantly to get your stuff out there. So that was it. And we, we raised, we were raising, we raised 2.6 million overall my first cycle, which is, which is good. But the reason why it jumped to a, to a higher level, we, we were at like 750,000 and then Congressman Engel made a big mistake. Um, I don't know if you heard of the hot mic moment, but he said something on the hot mic and it was caught. And when that happened, it went viral and we raised like a hundred grand that day, 90 grand the next day and average raising 70 grand every day up until election what day. What do you say? So, uh, George Floyd was murdered. Um, there were, there were um, protests all over the country. There's protests on Fordham Road um, where some property was damaged. And elected leaders, elected leaders came through uh, to to have a press conference to, you know, what elected leaders do: calm down, don't destroy no property, whatever. So he, um, he, you see him coming to the screen, coming to the shot where they're at the podium, and he asked to speak. I guess he arrived late. He asked to speak, 
And Ruben Diaz Jr. Um, was telling him, like, now nah, we got a lot of speakers. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's pandemonium right here. We, we don't have time to let you speak. And he pulls down his mask and he says, if I if I didn't have a primary, I wouldn't care. And and Ruben was, was like, what did you say? Did you say it again? He was like, if I didn't have a primary, I wouldn't care. So I didn't see this happen in real time. Um, someone, I was doing call time and someone hit me. He was like, yo, Jamal, you heard what Engel just said? I was like, what are you talking about? He was like, he said if he had, didn't have a primary, he wouldn't care. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm doing call time. He was like, go to Facebook Live, rewind to the beginning, and watch it. So we watched it, and I'm like, oh, shit. So we had the WhatsApp chat with the comms team. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yo, did y'all see this? They was like, nah. I was like, yo, rewind to this moment when Engel comes in. They saw it. They, they, they cut it. And they tried to give it to News 12, Westchester. And they didn't know what they had. They didn't understand what was going on. So we gave it to New York One. And by the end of that day, this was the morning. By the end of the day, it had 1.1 million views, mm. and it and it um and it led every local news station across the country, and that's how we were able to raise that money and and and, and ride that momentum. And the next day, we got the ALC endorsement, then Bernie, then Elizabeth Warren. It was just crazy, man. But yeah, we, you know, so we were able. Just one last thing, because we were able to raise that money. You know, they had all these negative attack ads and, and these commercials where they were attacking me for not paying my taxes 20 years ago, like something I completely forgot. It was actually wrong because when I looked it up, I actually paid them. But, you know, the ads were like, you know, type in Jamal Bowman and you'll see that, uh, you know, he doesn't pay his taxes. And the funny thing about that is, well, one, the money we raised was, was helpful in counteracting those so they didn't have a big impact. But also, too, it made me more like endearing with the people because people was like, yo, I owe way more than that. Like, Y'all trying to say he owed 25? Ain't nothing. I owe way more than that right now, you know? So it it, it obviously all, all worked out. And that's all they had because, you know, the former congressman, you know, was there 31 years, chair the Foreign Affairs Committee. You know, his most important topic was supporting the state of Israel. Uh, and he had neglected the district. You know, Mount Vernon, Yonkers, they hadn't seen him. He didn't even live in the district anymore. Mm. So, yeah, you know, we was able to win. Big one. Big, big. So how are you able to um, not take money from corporates or lobbyists when, I mean, they can, well, all right. The first time I can see, because it kind of happened with the George Floyd situation, you said something mm -hmm. stupid, and then it just kind of, but now, if they want to go against you and, and have an opposition, how are you able to, you know, withstand that? Yeah, so um, we just finished a primary cycle uh, where I had a couple challengers who were able to raise pretty decent money. You know, they spent almost a little over a million uh, against me to win, um, and we were able to raise over a million again, and, you know, just so we could do our commercials and everything we need to do. You know, uh, Bernie Sanders created the blueprint pretty much in, in 2016. So when he also doesn't take corporate PAC money. And when he ran, uh, he was raising tens of millions of dollars with just small dollar contributions. I mean, there's 300 million people in the country, right? And if everyone gave a dollar, that's 300 million, right? So um, small dollar contributions from a large amount of people who really want to see progressive change, who really, you know, recognize that, you know, our government has been inadequate uh, for a number of years and we want to see change. We want to see radical change. And, and to be honest, that was part of Trump's appeal as well, you know, as an outsider uh, coming in and he got a lot of support as well. Um, but Bernie created the blueprint. It was uh, modeled again by the squad they were able to raise good money and won. Um, so when we ran, the blueprint was already there. So when I started making my calls, and that's a big part of it, just dialing for dollars. When I started making my calls, there was already like an infrastructure in place to support progressive candidates like me with money to help us run for office. Um, and now, you know, that's kind of in cruise control um, right now because now I got like, People, people have decided to, you know, give X amount per month to, to my campaign, no matter what. So I get like, you know, a few hundred to a few thousand dollars every day just on the strength, 
you know, uh, of, of what I've done so far. Um, but we're actually trying to take that to the next level. Um, and that was one of the things I wanted to mention, uh, you know, when I knew I was coming here, is uh, the power of the black dollar. I know y'all talk about that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and the untapped potential of our money, um, not just from a, from a finance and an investment standpoint, but from a political power standpoint. You know, if we were to leverage our collective dollar, uh, we could become a powerful lobby that could then move things in Congress in a way. When you say we could be, a, who, who's we? Well, black people, the black people, the culture, people who are disengaged right now can be. So if there was a black lobby, who's the strongest lobby in Washington? The Israel lobby, I would argue. Is it APEC? APEC. APEC's a very strong lobby. Mm -hmm. um, the fossil fuel lobby is also very strong. Probably pharmaceutical health insurance. So let's use this APEC as yeah. an example. So APEC is the, what does that stand for? <clears throat> Whatever it's the Israel it's it's the pro Israel it's a, it's lobby. It's a pro right? Israel lobby, yes. So, all right, let's say black people wanted to have a lobby that's strong. Mm -hmm. What break down that lobby? Like, how did what does that lobby look like? Well, they are APAC. Using APAC as an example, they are relentless in ensuring that members of Congress support the state of Israel. Like, what does that mean? Though? Like, support Israel's right to exist, to or or else. Or we not rocking with you, well, we're gonna, and we're gonna, we're gonna come gonna, after we're you. Gonna try to take yeah, the yeah, yeah. Take, yeah. We're gonna try to take you off yeah. Congress. Like, yes, take, take the dollars, take your position, and well, well, yes. I mean, so it's it's interesting because there are members of Congress who are progressive who support the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. I'm one included, right? But I also talk about Palestinian rights and making sure that we end the occupation and uplift Palestinian humanity. So I'm one of a few who does this. Mm. The majority of members of Congress don't really talk about Palestinian rights enough, right? And that particular lobby, APAC, don't really care about that. They rock with, you support the state of Israel, you support our right to defend ourselves exists, blah, 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 boom, we'll support you. And we'll support you with big numbers. And me and the squad in particular, and other progressives who are squad adjacent, they come after us consistently, um, and not just with money and challengers, but also with um, with media and newspapers. You know, my my, my uh, primary opponents. There's this publication called the Jewish Insider uh, that was straight up just they would just write mad glowing reviews about my opponents and never wrote nothing glowing about me. You know what I mean? So stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, media impact. So. Boom, they ride or die for Israel. The question for me is, as black people, what are we riding to die for, right? Like, is it a nation? Is it a, a, a 10 point plan? Is it whatever it is? And then the, the PAC or the lobby can raise money in alignment with that agenda and make sure members of Congress support that agenda to be supported by this lobby that has yet to be created yet. So what's, well, the, like, what's the infrastructure in place? Like they have, like if we wanted to create a lobby, right? Mm -hmm. What do you need to create a lobby? Like you need, all right. So obviously you have the money, but you, so you have to have fundraisers that are connected to actually fundraising all over the world. In mm -hmm. that case, they're fundraising money from all over the world, right? Then you have leadership inside the actual lobby. Mm -hmm. Then you have point people that's actually working on the ground, reaching out to the yes. congressmen, to the senators, to every. To those are like lobbyists. Those are lobbyists. Lobbyists, right? yeah. So mm -hmm. all of those fall into place when developing a lobby. Yes. Well, under the umbrella of a PAC, a political action committee. Political action committee. Yeah. So we have, so I ran for Congress under the under Bowman for Congress. That's just my, you know, it, it, it's actually a business when you think about it. Bowman for Congress, I ran for Congress. I just recently started a leadership PAC um, where it's called For the Children PAC, uh, where I'm going to be raising money uh, to support other progressive candidates and causes across the country related to kids. There are also super PACs, and this is where some of that dark money stuff comes mm. into play. The main point for me regarding this lobby piece, when I got to, as soon as I won my election, the next day in my mail, I was hearing from the pro-life lobby. Mm -hmm. They sent me like 20 postcards, pro-life, protect the unborn, blah, 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 boom. My office consistently consistently gets calls from multiple lobbies about around multiple issues. We rarely, if ever, get calls from a black lobby, for lack of a better term. 
Do they not exist? Uh, that's an infrastructure that needs to be stronger. There are pieces to it. Yeah. But, but do, you it's think, not... do you think that it's like, all right, so like, let's take Israel. They, they can have a main focus for one issue. Yes. The state of Israel. Mm -hmm. Protect it, make sure it's thriving, whatever. Yep. But black people, it's so many different issues. Yeah. So it's like you got reparations, you got criminal justice reform, you got education. And, and then, so do you think that that makes it harder? Or it, would it be easier to start a pack for one issue, like a reparations pack? Just or, yeah. or like you know what I'm saying? As yes. opposed to trying to cover thirty five different things. Yes. Right. And and reparations could be that thing because that's the thing that kind of touches everything. Right. So um and the thing about reparations, this is the first Congress where reparations was actually voted out of committee. So let me just explain that real quick. When I introduce a bill, when any member of Congress introduces a bill, that bill is assigned to the committee based on the content. The uh, HR 40, the reparations bill, or the bill to form a committee to study the potential need for reparations, that bill is always assigned to the judicial committee, the judi excuse me, judiciary committee. Mm -hmm. This was the first Congress that that committee actually marked it up, meaning they looked at the bill, they discussed potential amendments, they had debate and conversation in committee, and then it was voted on in committee to come out of committee to now be brought to the floor for a vote. First time it's happened in history, and it's been introduced for 30 years in a row. 30, yeah, 30 years in a row. Um, but, and it has 216 co-sponsors, and the magic number in Congress is 218. You get to 218, you got the votes you need for it to pass. However, even though it's not, it, it, it has been voted out of committee, it hasn't, we haven't taken the House floor vote on it yet. Mm. Now, let's say there was a reparations lobby or a reparations uh, uh, pack with big money. This is the key, big money. Because there are people lobbying for reparations. They don't got the big money with them, with big money. And when I say big money, this should say tens of millions of dollars in this pack. That would help to lean on leadership, to lean on members of Congress, to to push to make sure this bill comes to the floor for a vote. Let me also say this, because it's not it's it's about money. Money's a big thing. Also, the Congressional Black Caucus and some of the other caucuses can we could do better to leverage our power to make sure this bill comes to the floor for a vote. And we don't do enough of that. And that's where outside organizing and pushing us to do it is really important. And that doesn't even take money. That's just people agitating. Hmm. So if the Congressional Black Caucus theoretically was like, we supporting no bill until reparation comes to the full four vote. We could do that. Hmm. So, so and we haven't done that, which is very frustrating <laughs> as a member of the Black Caucus because we have the numbers. No bill can move through Congress without the Congressional Black Caucus. The thing about it is, are we willing to take the heat that's going to come from that? You know, there's times in Congress where you got to make a, you know, we've done it this year where we've taken votes that people didn't understand that were very controversial. And we've been dragged like very publicly for it for a very long period of time. And the thing about that is people use that to run against you. So, you know, people ran against me this cycle. Um, claiming, you know, my lack of support of Israel and, and I'm and I'm an anti Semitic and and you know, I don't support jobs because I voted against the infrastructure bill and, and, and you know, it didn't work because we 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 always communicated honestly and authentically with who we are. So anyway, it's the lobby, it's the pack and there's money behind it, but it's also us just having the will um and the courage to like make decisions that would completely transform the system and leverage our power in a real way. Yeah, so when, I mean, so just really quickly, I got a couple of questions. The The difference between PAC and Super PAC is just the amount of money that's put into each? Well, Super PAC, um, and I may get this wrong, so forgive me, but Super PAC is a PAC where you put all kind of money into it, yeah. um, and it could be undisclosed and, and fall under the umbrella of dark money. And that's where you get into a place where now we don't have a democracy anymore. We have like a, <laughs> a, a oligarchy where money is controlling all of it. So I would 
not probably start a super PAC because I don't want to get into that world. Yeah. Having said that, you know, I'm, I've learned that politics is a dirty business. It's way dirtier than the streets. It's way dirtier than all of it, right? Mm-hmm. So, and I don't mean dirty in a way like, I mean, yes, it's corrupt and grimy, but you got to be ready to fight, like for real. Um, because there are people, there, there, or there are lobbies and um, packs out there with power that don't care if you live or die. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're from a certain group, if you don't support their shit, like if you don't support what they support, they don't care what happens to you. So now that I, I peep, it's like that. It's like okay, now I'm gonna move differently. You know, the sec, the second term. Yeah, the, the other part was, and you spoke about it right in the bill. So I mean, obviously, as you look at the economy now, obviously inflation's forty year high. When you go into your office, you sit down. You talk about like that, like how, the process of creating the bill. What are the things you're looking for? How are you trying to answer or create yeah. solutions around the problem? That's a great question. So with the issue of inflation, a major component of it is is price gouging. So a lot of companies are, are raising costs so that they can increase profit margins in lieu of what's happening with the pandemic. So, you know, the economy was about to go into a depression. The government infused money into the into the pockets of people through direct payments, through the child tax credit, through some other means. Companies saw people had more money and was like, we gonna raise our prices a little bit just to make sure we uh, we continue to make the profits we want. And there's a supply chain issue, which when you look at supply and demand, you know, uh, less supply, more demand, higher costs, more profit, right? Mm-hmm. So we introduced uh, a few bills. One is the Emergency Price Stabilization Act. And this bill proposes, empowers the president to put, put price caps on certain goods. Um, So price cap on rent, price cap on groceries, price cap on gas, certain areas where we like give the president authority to do this so that we can survive this, um, this inflation and what's happening now Mm -hmm. so that people don't, aren't struggling as much. So that was one bill we introduced. The, another bill we introduced is something called the ending corporate greed act, which would tax corporate, corporate profits, uh, for a period of time at 90% so that we can reinvest in the areas we need like universal childcare because still we have millions of women who haven't returned back to work. Now, 90% sounds like a lot, but even they, their profits have been so high since the pandemic, even if you tax their profits at 90%, they still make more of a profit than they did before the pandemic. So that's how much they've been, they've been caking. So those are two pieces of legislation. Um, one other piece that's not directly related to uh, the inflation piece is uh, something we call the Babies Over Billionaires Act. So unrealized capital gains right now is untaxed. Um, it could be leveraged to uh, to borrow against and, and help companies and individuals to increase their wealth because it's not taxed. The president offered a tax on capital gains so people can't build their wealth without contributing. Um, so we wrote a bill in alignment with the president's ass there, um, babies over billionaires. So those are three pieces of, of legislation we introduced in, in response to the current rate of inflation. One other thing I want to say about inflation, you know, there, there are flaws in our economic system, in my opinion, because one of the ways the Fed tries to control for inflation is to raise interest rates to stop the borrowing, stop the flow of money. Um, what that does is also increase unemployment. And so for for the for inflation to be under control in our current economic system, unemployment has to be at like three, four percent. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, again, I, I, I support I support a federal jobs guarantee. I think everyone should be working. I don't think we should have an economic system that has to function based on a certain level of unemployment. Um so there are fundamental aspects of our economy that need to change. Um, let me ask you this: As far as um, reparations, since we're at it, what's your view on reparations? We need it. Um, uh, not only do we need it, so reparations is about repairing the harm of the past, right? And so, this country was founded on indigenous genocide and the enslavement of 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 Africans. Um, 
And since then, even when the enslavement was over, there have been laws that have continued to negatively impact the black community. Right after uh, the passage of the 13th Amendment, um, after Lincoln was killed uh, and the new president took over, a piece of legislation called the Homestead Act uh, was passed. And the Homestead Act pretty much gave, as we expanded out west, the majority of that new land, 90% of it was given to white people, both native born and foreign born. And African Americans by and large weren't, didn't have privy to that. So that land and what was the cities and, and towns and villages that was built on that land, wealth built on that land, we weren't able to benefit from that. So that's one sort of post-slavery piece of legislation that continues to impact black people negatively today. Of course, the Klan, of course, Jim Crow laws, of course, black laws and all of that. Um, in addition to that, black banks were started and proliferated um, post-slavery all across the country, but they've never received the investments from the federal government to help keep them solvent and to help them grow into the investment banks that could be used to invest back in the black community. Um, the uh, It's a great book by uh, Mirza Baradaran, How the Other Half Banks, that tells the story about how this works. In contrast to that, Bank of America used to be the Bank of Italy, and they became the Bank of America through investments from the federal government to support its growth. But black banks have never received that still to this day. One other piece of legislation I want to focus on is the um, the GI Bill and the New Deal, right? So FHA uh, approved loans, mm -hmm. low interest rates, low costs, 97% uh, went to white people, and blacks weren't allowed to access those loans at the same rate. White flight occurred. They moved into these new suburbs, built their own communities. We were forced to stay in the hood. And FHA devalued our communities simply because they were black and redlined them. And that's why you see us in the projects, in underfunded communities, in underfunded. And, and then connected to that, because local property taxes fund schools, um, our schools continue to be underfunded as a result of that. So. It's not just slave reparations for slavery. It's reparations for slavery and everything that has come since then. And I haven't even mentioned mass incarceration, mm. which is another and the war, war on drugs. Yeah. And so, the war on drugs, so, right? So, 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 the so this is all. So, but so because of all of that, but you're in a position to write legislation. Yes. Um, okay. If you guys write a bill, what does that look like? How much money would you think it would be appropriate? Who gets it? That's extremely important because how do we determine um, who who should get it? Yeah. For in my brain, it should be black people that can trace their history back to slavery. Mm -hmm. That can be difficult because you have to give every single person a test, right? Or you have to check their records mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. three, five generations, which that's kind of a tedious process. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, how do you do this? So there's a way to do it. Um, that's the reason for the HR 40 bill, um, because the commission who will study all this and present a report, they will also present a way to get it done. Um, Congress hasn't even had the courage to move forward with forming a commission to even study it. So we're not even at step one even though there's many studies that have been done around the importance of this and the impact of de facto and de jure uh, racism. So the point is, let's figure out how to do it, right? Um, and as a country, let's go through a process of truth and reconciliation, similar to Rwanda after the genocide, um, similar to South Africa uh, after apartheid. Germany. Germany after the Holocaust, let's go through a process uh, of truth and reconciliation and figuring out what reckon, re reckon reparations could look like. Um, we haven't done that. And there have been other groups that receive reparations, you know, uh, Japanese Americans for internment, um, Jewish Americans and Jews in Germany as well, um, and other groups. So there's precedent na internationally and, and nationally 
Um, it's just the consistency of white supremacy and anti-black racism lives and breathes in every in every aspect of American society, in the halls of Congress, in the hearts and minds of people, black and non-black. Um, we often just, you know, take what we could get and don't fight for more. Um, and so, yeah, uh, we've, that HR 40 is one bill. We've written other bills and we are gonna write more bills that deal with pieces of it. So uh, there's a bill we're gonna be working on called the 21st Century Homestead Act, um, which looks to make the investments in red line communities to help build black economic strength within those communities. Um, we're gonna be writing that bill. We've written a bill called the Green New Deal for Public Schools, which sort of does the same thing, but with a focus on investing in public schools that have been underfunded and using those schools as models for the renewable energy revolution that's coming right now. Yeah, you know? well, one of the issues that you didn't bring up, but I'm sure you're passionate about, student loan debt. Um, yeah. Obviously, we, we know disproportionately, if you look at Pell Grants, the majority of the people who apply for them look like us. Um, and right now, President Biden's student debt cancellation has been paused. Um, so I want to get your thoughts around that um, and, and the impact that student loan debt has had on our community. Yeah, man. I mean, it sucks that it was paused. Uh, I wish Biden would have went bigger. I mean, we was pushing pushing him to cancel it all. Uh, he was talking about 50000 He landed on 10000 You know, the president's a, a, a rabid capitalist, you know, and I'm not necessarily against capitalism, but there's just toxic predatory nature of it that's been destructive and student loans is part of that. You know, I'll use me as an example. You know, my mother, my whole life was telling me I'm going to college, I'm going to college, I'm going to college. So when I graduated high school, I was like, okay, I'm going to college. I played football, so that helped a little bit with cost. But going to college and paying for college is two completely different things. So when you go, when I went, you know, filled out the application, look at this bill, how you gonna pay this bill? Well, we got these loans for you. I just took them, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I just took the loans, didn't understand interest rates, figured I would get a job, just pay it back, you know, done deal. And I'm not unique. I mean, millions of people have done this, disproportionately black and brown, disproportionately black women. Um, and now we're, we're I'm 23 years, uh, as a professional since I graduated college and, and still paying back student loans. I've met constituents who are in their 60s still paying back student, student loans, uh, crazy interest rates, predatory practice. You know, we believe that a large portion should be canceled. Um, and now, you know, we didn't talk much about, we haven't talked much about voting and the importance of it, but this is like another example, right? Because if, if, if lobbies, PACs, groups, consistently vote in elections at every level of government and we don't our people our culture whatever you want to call it don't then they're going to make laws that just control and impact the world and control and impact our lives whether that's a student loan issue a reparations issue or whatever it is um so yeah we have a supreme court now and and many in the court who you know are conservative aligned with trump and you know, to them, it's pull yourself up by your bootstraps, um, even though some people don't even have boots. So, yeah, man, it's crazy. And this is a big issue across race, across communities, like people knew they were preyed upon. And even people who are trying to be diligent and paying it back. When you're doing that, you can't afford to start a family, can't afford to buy a home, can't afford to invest the way the way you want. Um so yeah, it's another example of, this is why your show is great and the education piece of your show because people miseducated, they make decisions and they pay those decisions back for the rest of their lives. So, um, Congressional Black Caucus, <clears throat> what's your thoughts on that? What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> is it beneficial? Is it something that, you know? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we, um, it, yes, so yes, it is beneficial. Um, it, in many ways, it's like a home to to newly elected black members of Congress. Um, you know, it's good to good to be there with people who 
who look like you and have similar experiences, um, it's, it's, you know, very rooted in civil rights and black church traditions. Um, and rightly so, you know, when you think of John Lewis and Elijah Cummings and, and others who, who were some of the co-founders of it and, and who champions of it, you know, their entire career, um, that makes sense. But now there's a, a, a shift happen, happening, if you will, because you have people like myself, Ayana, Corey Bush, Ilhan Omar, and others who are newer, who are younger, who are coming in with different ideas um, and, 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 and thoughts on how we, should, how we should govern. And then it's also built on a seniority system. So like, you know, the OGs, you know, they kind of, they kind of control a lot of things. And, um, and all of Congress is built on a seniority system. So, uh, you know, what that does is that kind of squashes young, progressive, innovative voices. And then traditionally in, in, in the black community, if, you know, you don't really question or talk back to a Southern black man who's of a certain age, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so there's some of those dynamics at play. And yeah, there's been many times where, you know, I have wanted the CBC to be more, for lack of a better term, radical when it comes to certain things and pushing back. Uh, but this is my first term, so I've actually kind of sometimes take a step back and just like learn, how, learn the game, how it works. And I plan to be much more uh, assertive this this next term coming up. So, yeah, what, yeah, oh. one more question. Um, speaking about that, all right, Congressional Black Caucus. How many people's in it? Fifty something. How many people are Democrats? All of them. All right. So, this this is an issue. This is another issue. Because one thing about like the, the Jewish super PAC is that there's Jewish people on the Republican side and there's Jewish people on the Democratic side and they lobby on both sides. APAC does specifically. On both sides. Yes. So black people vote 95% Democrat. Mm -hmm. The whole entire Congressional Black Caucus is Democrat. That's not leverage. Mm -hmm. You're a Democrat, so obviously you might be you know, a little biased in a situation, but do you think that it's extremely harmful that we're so one-sided in this situation? Uh, I want to say extremely harmful. Um, and I'm going to answer, and it's going to sound like I'm evading the question, but I'm not. There just needs to be much more political education and engagement in our community so that we could build the political power that we need because starting the conversation with Republican Democrat and we shouldn't always be Democrat and we should listen to everybody else. That is very true. It is true, a true statement in the current climate of what the Republicans are doing. Um, in my opinion, it's harmful to rock with them right now because they, they, they just supported an attack on the Capitol and insurrection, the first since the war of 1812. And I have Republican colleagues who are blatant, like white supremacists, racist, Tucker Carlson, want to go to civil war, support the great replacement theory. Like they're members of the Republican party who rock like that and say that out loud. So in my opinion, at this moment, rocking with them is dangerous. All things being equal, where we all receive a political education and we leverage our collective political power and our money, we should be having those broad conversations. I also think we're, we're at a point or getting to a point where the two party system is obsolete, uh, because life is not a binary. It's not this or that. Mm -hmm. Um, there's so much diversity, not just racially and culturally and economically, but in terms of ideas, um, so I, I support us figuring out we need democracy reform overall. And part of that is really looking at the two party system and how it functions. Another part of that is ending the filibuster in the Senate, which is a rule that was just put into place uh, to stop civil rights legislation from moving What's forward. 
So the filibuster is the rule that requires a super majority in the Senate for a bill to pass. It came about, I'm forgetting one year, when uh, a lot of civil rights legislation was trying to move through the Senate. And some racist ass senators, I'm going to forget the names, uh, put this rule in place because they knew that there was no way that whoever was trying to move the civil rights legislation would get two thirds of the Senate to vote for it. And ever since that's been put in place, it's just still there. And it's a simple Senate rule that can be changed by the majority leader and and a civil vote at any time. The problem with the filibuster also is there's something called a talking filibuster with at the very least, uh, you, um, have to debate your position on a bill. And then at the end of the debate, um, you take a vote and a simple majority wins in terms of how to move forward. Right now, there's not even a talking filibuster. There's no debate. They could just vote however they want and keep it moving. So in terms of democracy reform, you know, taking a fresh look at the two party system, taking a fresh look at the filibuster, actually, in my opinion, just ending it, taking a look at the electoral college as well. Mm, um, cause the electoral college, <laughs> <laughs> the, the pop one man, one person, one vote in a democracy should decide the presidency. The electoral college doesn't allow for that to happen. And what happens is you'll have states with smaller populations having more as much or more power than the majority of the American people, what some refer to as minority rule. Um, So right now in the Senate, even though it's 50 50, the 50 Democrats actually represent more people than the 50 Republicans. Does anybody even know who the electoral college officials are? Uh, Delegates and super delegates. I'm in Congress. I still don't even understand how that works. But what I do understand is we have a system in place right now where we have members of Congress, House and Senate, who represent less people but wield more power. That's not democracy. And the filibuster is one way where they continue to yield that power. So the political education, I'm glad you brought that up because it almost feels like how do we get it? We saw over 140 million people vote for the general election, and a lot of people come around that. But the midterm election is here, and I don't feel like the same amount of awareness, right? If you look at the presidential election, very important, but these localized officials are the ones who can change your immediate life. Yeah. And so we don't even look at it like that. How do we get the political education to really, for, to get people to really understand, like these localized elections are the ones that are changing your daily life? Yeah. We need to uh, destroy and rebuild our public education system. Uh, because many aspects of the curriculum and the schedule and the structure are obsolete. There's absolutely no way we should allow our kids in a democracy to graduate not really having a clear political education. And there's nothing in place right now to make that happen. And this is why, you know, cities who don't have mayoral control, city, New York City has mayoral control, but even that, you sh- we should do more organizing and push there. But this is why local school board elections matter. So if you got a school board of seven people in Greenberg, for example, and you could get four people who believe what we believe on that school board, now that's now you have a majority on that school board, and that school board decides what happens with the superintendent. The school superintendents work for the school board. Mm-hmm. So the school board decides we want to change this person and bring in somebody else who's going to bring in a financial literacy curriculum, who's going to bring in project-based learning, who's going to bring in STEM, civic education, all of it. Now that school board can transform education in that school district. And this is where Republicans are way better than Democrats at, you know, because they move as a unified front. They fight like their lives depend on it. And they fight from the school board to the president. And that's how we're going to have to fight, regardless of your party, to get what we want. And because, in my opinion, because we've been so beaten down by miseducation and lack of resources in the system overall, we often unplug. And when I say we, I mean black men, I mean black people, I mean the culture. Um, And we can't unplug because we just have so much power that we just haven't begun to use yet. And I hope to and I hope to be a part of changing that. Well, we can have this conversation all day because there's a lot to talk about. (laughs) Yeah, man. 
Thank you for coming. Of course, uh, man. A lot of education. That's that's extremely important because I feel like people are educated on the political process and there's so much, like I said, this we just scratching the surface. There's so much more stuff to actually cover. And, um, you know, it's good. Our whole platform is built around education, whether it's financial education, but the political education goal is just as important. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's important. And, you know, I appreciate you having that. It wasn't a partisan conversation it wasn't a, you know something where it's more so like an, an endorsement or something it was just more so just the education mm-hmm. and that's something that's extremely important and that's in line with what we do so thank you for coming and, and appreciate that and thank you how can the people stay in touch with you what do you want to tell the people what's some last words that you want to yeah absolutely so uh you know you could go to bowman.house.gov to look at you know to sign up for a newsletter please do that you know, it just helps you to stay informed on everything that we're doing. Um, and, and it helps you to look at legislation uh, that we're working on and let us to Biden, all the, all of our advocacy. So that's on the, that's on the um, official congressional side. On the campaign side, you can go to bowmanforcongress.com, uh, learn more about the campaign, and you could easily find us on social media at Jamal Bowman NY. Um, I just want to emphasize... Uh, the importance of leveraging our collective economic and political power. Um, we we have come so far historically in terms of our accomplishments and what we've survived and the power we've built individually and in, and in small pockets. But just if we could figure out how to bring that together in the same way that I see these lobbyists <laughs> trying to come at me in Congress right now and how and I didn't want to be this long winded, but I could get to, I could go back to Washington on a Monday. They could give us the schedule for the week to tell us what we're going to be voting on, whatever. And a particular lobby can call leadership on a Tuesday and be like, yo, I want y'all to vote on this bill tomorrow and we'll vote on it on Wednesday. That's the power that some groups are wielding in Congress right now. And, and we, can wield the same power through unity and our collective uh, finances and political strength. That's powerful. Like I told you, the the day I walked into your school, I felt inspired. I feel inspired again. Um, I wish you nothing but success, my brother. Thank you, brother. Um, you didn't notice this, but I read that you're a huge Wu Tang fan. I'm a what? Huge Wu Tang fan. Yes, sir. Yes. And so I put up 36 Chambers. I, I did up. notice it. <laughs> I was trying to keep my composure. I did notice it. <laughs> All right, here we go. Best Wu Tang album. Shit. Collective or, or solo? First of all, what you have around here, I don't, people can't see everything, so you got you got that up. But and oh oh, I ain't see that one. Yeah yeah. Damn. Well, I'm gonna be honest with you. I had I had ODB up there, but I I, I wow. figured let me let me go di- a little different. Damn. And you got the Cuban Links joint. You got <laughs> Shook Ones. Uh, best Wu Tang album. This is the this is the hardest question to answer, obviously. Um. <laughs> I would probably, and this is a weak answer. I mean, Wu-Tang Forever, I think, is incredible and a very underrated album. It's very underrated. But I would probably have to go with 36 Chambers. 36 Chambers. Chambers. Okay. I would probably have to go with 36 Chambers. Even though, see, it's, it's too hard. I count only, like, my top five albums, top ten albums probably have, like, three or four Wu-Tang albums. Only built for Cuban Links is it's fucking incredible. <laughs> <laughs> that's the right answer. That's, that's what I'm saying. Like that's like how you gonna Yeah, we put Iron Man up there too. I see it. Okay, okay, okay. And it's argue and Supreme Client tells arguable arguably better. Might be than better that. than that. This is true. This is true. This is true. See, these dudes are like this it's, it's incredible. So yeah. only go for Cuban links. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean that when that came out Purple Tape. The purple tape. And when all these when all, when every album came out, I was going to the store every day. Just waiting for the next Wu Tang album to drop, and when that dropped, I was so tired. Like I, I, but I didn't allow myself to fall asleep. I stayed up to listen to the whole album, and by the time it got to, I would say rainy days, it was just like, yo, this is this is incredible, and it's so perfect that you got it right next to Illmatic. Oh uh, yeah, that's the centerpiece. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. another conversation. But thank you for having me, man. Appreciate I appreciate it. you coming, man. Uh, thank you guys for rocking with us. We'll see you next week. Peace. Peace. My graduates from my school being Forbes. Bag drop. Bag drop. <laughs> <laughs>
Drop. Bag drop. Bag drop. <laughs>